Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Isabel Lilias and I'm one of the Ath Fellows this year. A few nights ago, I woke up from my sleep to grab some water. I exited my door and to my right on the couch was a girl. Her face was buried in her hands and her whole body was trembling. She looked up at me and hurried to wipe her face. I ran back to my room and came out with some Kleenex. I offered it to her and she took it. Do you want to talk? I asked. She remained silent. I would have too. I asked her if she wanted me to walk her back to her room, but she said she did not want to wake her roommates. Do you want to hang out in my room for a little bit? I can make you some tea, I said. At first, there was more silence, but after a minute, she nodded her head and we walked over. She sat on the corner of my bed while I prepared two cups of chamomile tea. The boiling water filled the silence. I was pouring the water into the mugs when she asked me, was it difficult for you coming here? What do you mean, I reply. I feel like I'm not good enough, she said. I feel like I've made the wrong decision. Have you ever felt that way? It was my turn to be silent. I did not expect to be the one on the responding end. If I lied and said no, that would not have made her feel better. But I was reluctant to open up and tell her the truth. I usually only share these hardships with those I know and trust. Here we were, in this room, one trying to understand the other, suspended between compassion and confession. I first came across tonight's speaker's work in my freshman writing seminar back in the spring of 2015. My professor assigned her collection of essays, the empathy exams, as one of the core readings. The collection is an exploration of the complexities of the human condition, focusing on emotions, identity, and as the title suggests, empathy, or understanding others. Tonight's speaker presents a unique, vulnerable perspective that sheds light on experiences that are simultaneously personal and universal, emotional and physical, recognizable and indescribable. Leslie Jameson is a novelist and an essayist. She has worked as a baker, an office temp, an innkeeper, a tutor, and a medical actor, all of which still inform her writing today. She has written about a variety of subjects, including the experiences of athletes, prison inmates, and medical patients alike. Her work has appeared in Harper's, Oxford American, A Public Space, Virginia Quarterly Review, and The Believer. Her novel, The Gin Closet, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction and was one of San Francisco Chronicle's best books of 2010. She is also a columnist for the New York Times Book Review and an assistant professor at Columbia University. Professor Jameson's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Center of Writing and Public Discourse. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time. Please join me in welcoming Leslie Jameson to the AF. Thank you, Isabel, for such a lovely introduction. I, um, I mean, in a way, it was an act of confession as offering to all of us to think about those ways in which um, sometimes communion happens in silence and sometimes it happens through speaking or sharing and often sharing that which feels vulnerable or personal. So thank you. Um, also thank you to um, Priya and to Wes as well as Isabel. All of you have made me feel so cared for since I've been here and Really, to all of the students that I've had the pleasure of speaking to, it's been inspiring to hear about the things that you guys are working on and wrestling with. Um, so I hope that the thoughts that I'm going to share um, add something to that wrestling. And I will be very, very excited to be in conversation after I finish talking. So um, save your questions and hurl them all at me once I'm done. Um, so. As Priya mentioned, or sorry, as uh, Isabel mentioned, um, my, yeah, my work involves uh, a kind of practice 
that is composed of telling my own story alongside the stories of others. Um, so I bring the personal into conversation with the reporting and all kinds of research, often archival research. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is specifically this question of what it means to write about the lives of other people and um, the ethical complexities of that act and, and hopefully the ethical possibilities of that act. At the beginning of The Journalist and the Murderer, her classic meditation on the interpersonal dynamics of reportage, Janet Malcolm offers what might be called an aphoristic provocation. It's become infamous. She says, every journalist who is not too stupid or full of himself to notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indefensible. He is a kind of confidence man preying on people's vanity, ignorance, or loneliness, gaining their trust and betraying them without remorse. The first time I read this, I felt simultaneously consoled by it and preemptively haunted by it. I felt consoled by it because I'd already begun to feel the ways in which writing about other people was sometimes going to hurt them or make them feel betrayed, and it felt good to know I wasn't alone in that betrayal. But I also felt haunted by it because I didn't want to spend my life making people feel abused and betrayed. I knew that I couldn't write with integrity if I wrote to please everyone I wrote about, but I also knew that I wanted to find a way to write about people that felt guided by a spirit of appreciation and empathy. Over the years, I've written about people suffering from a disease that no one else believes in. I've written about a blue whale dubbed the loneliest whale in the world, a whale no one has ever seen, a whale with a song unlike anything ever heard, and the people who have become obsessed with that whale. I've written about parents who believe their kids have past life memories. I just finished a book that's about, among other things, a group of elderly alcoholics who went to the same Maryland rehab program back in the early 1970s, right when Nixon launched his war on drugs. I've tried to find a way to write about the lives of others that manages something other than betrayal. As I've struggled with this in my own work, I've been drawn to writers and reporters who understood themselves as somehow deeply obligated to the subjects they wrote about. In 1887, an aspiring reporter named Nellie Bly arrived at a women's boarding house on 2nd Avenue, pretended to be insane. She'd practiced her crazy eyes in front of her own bathroom mirror and got herself sent to an asylum on Blackwell's Island in the middle of the East River in New York. She wrote sensational newspaper reports that peddled spectacle as well as lamenting injustice. She described women, quote, on the rope, harnessed to a long chain, spiders baked into stale bread, the reeking gin breath of an attendant, the cruelty of nurses teasing a blind woman or beating a woman for crying too much, slapping her face, knocking her head, dragging her into a closet. Bly wrote, I plainly saw the marks of their fingers on her throat for the entire day. Her text made the marks visible for more than a century, left their residue in newsprint. She described a woman separated from her five children, begging to hold the infant child of a visitor. Quote, when the visitor wanted to leave, the woman's grief was uncontrollable as she begged to keep the babe which she imagined was her own. At night, Bly looked through the bars of her room at the lights of Manhattan faintly glimmering, which, quote, seemed so near, and yet heaven is not further from hell. She wrote, all night long, I listened to a woman cry about the cold and beg for God to let her die. Her writing insisted to her readers, while you are here, they are there. 
Her writing said, while you are reading this sentence, they are on the rope or eating spiders or begging strangers to leave their babies or begging God to let them die. In the summer of 1936, a young journalist named James Agee spent several months with three sharecropper families in Alabama. Quote, everything there was un unpredictable from day to day, he wrote in a letter to a friend. I was half crazy with the heat and diet. The trip was very hard and certainly one of the best things I've ever had happen to me. But he said, writing what we found is a different matter. What had he found? He'd found the unceasing depletions of hard work in cotton fields. He found well water that tasted, quote, sad on the mouth. He found spoiled pork and barefoot children. He found a mother ravaged by eight years of pellagra, her skin red and blistered from lesions. He found flies, quote, vibrating to death in dirty glasses of buttermilk, families living in two-room shacks with the ghosts of their dead children. He wanted to offer an account of all that, wanted to bear witness to it, but he wasn't fluent in any language that could hold it. He wanted to make visible the spectacular brutality of their labor. He wanted to fight what he called the intuitive structures of a system that normalized this labor, that made it okay for some people to live like this while others profited, the system that dissolved the brutality of this arrangement into simple pragmatism. He wanted his writing to do all this, but he felt suspicious of every kind of writing he knew. He wanted to, quote, tell everything possible as accurately as possible with as total a suspicion of creative and artistic as of repertorial attitudes and methods. He wrote that everything he wrote would come up short. He said, I feel sure in advance that any efforts in what follows along the lines I have been speaking of will be failures. His book began by saying he wished it wasn't a book at all. He said, if I could do it, I'd do no writing at all here. It would be photographs. The rest would be fragments of cloth, bits of cotton, lumps of earth records of speech, pieces of wood and iron, files of odors, plates of food and of excrement. A piece of the body torn out by the roots might be more to the point. He wanted to know how art could ever respond to suffering. It's not just a question for artists, but a question for anyone who lives alongside the pain of others, which is to say, all of us, everywhere, how do we live alongside injustice? In 2000, a poet named C.D. Wright traveled with a photographer to three prisons in Louisiana. I will be wakeful, she told herself before those trips. It is a summons. In her wakefulness, she met a man named Grasshopper standing beside a coffin he'd built in the woodshop. He told her he'd come in when his wife was pregnant, now his son was in prison. She met a man who'd, quote, hung strips of a plastic bag from his bunk and pretended he was in his boat and his cellmates flushing the Arctic Ocean. She met a woman who said, I miss the moon. She heard about the last requests of a man before his execution. He, quote, preferred to eat with the warden. He, quote, asked that his mother not be present. He, quote, asked that his eyes be given to another. She called her account of these trips one big self because she was interested in her encounters as acts of reunification, bringing the artist back into society, bringing inmates back into public view. The popular perception is that art is a part, she wrote. I insist it is a part of. Something not in dispute is that people in prison are apart from. If you can accept, 
whatever level of discipline and punishment you adhere to momentarily aside, that the ultimate goal should be to reunite the separated from the larger human enterprise, it might behoove us to see prisoners among others as they elect to be seen in their larger selves. Later, she wrote, nothing will be settled or made easy. One grasshopper, a lost moon, and an Arctic ocean later, she wrote, there is no point and we will not shrink from it. What must we not shrink from? I've struggled constantly with the prospect of betraying my own subjects. At the end of one piece, I even confessed that fear directly. It was a piece I wrote about a mysterious condition called Morgellons disease, the illness I mentioned earlier, a controversial illness whose self-declared sufferers report a variety of skin symptoms, including, most remarkably, unexplainable material emerging from their skin, fibers and fuzz and threads. I traveled to their annual conference in Austin, Texas, not so much to determine whether Morgellons was real or not, but to document the community that had formed around it. I went there wanting to be compassionate, and I did find myself experiencing compassion toward people who were suffering. But I also felt increasingly that I didn't agree with their own understanding of their suffering source. I closed the piece like this. I want to sit down in front of everyone I've heard, listen to their voices in my tape recorder like a child could listen, like an agnostic, like a pluralist. I want to be the compassionate nurse, not the skeptical doctor. I want the abyss, not the verdict. I want to believe everyone. I want everyone to be right. But compassion isn't the same thing as belief. This isn't a lesson I want to learn. It wasn't until the 17th century that the words pity and piety were fully distinguished. Sympathy was understood as a kind of duty, an obligation to some basic human bond. And what I feel toward this disorder is a kind of piety. I feel an obligation to pay homage or at least accord some reverence to these patients' collective understanding of what makes them hurt. Maybe it's a kind of sympathetic infection in its own right, this need to go along with, to nod along with, to support, to agree. Paul, one of my subjects, said, I wouldn't tell anyone my crazy ass symptoms, but he told them to me. He's always been met with disbelief. He called it typical. Now I'm haunted by that word. For Paul, life has become a pattern, and the moral of that pattern is you're destined for this. The disbelief of others is inevitable, and so is loneliness. Both are just as much a part of this disease as any fiber, supposed or actual, any speck or crystal or flock of bugs. I went to Austin because I wanted to be a different kind of listener than the kind these patients had known. Doctors winking at their residents, friends biting their lips, skeptics smiling smug. But wanting to be different doesn't make you so. Paul told me his crazy ass symptoms and I didn't believe him. Or at least I didn't believe him in the way he wanted to be believed. I didn't believe there were parasites laying thousands of eggs under his skin, but I did believe he hurt like there were, which was typical. I was typical. In writing this essay, how am I doing something that he wouldn't understand as betrayal? I want to say, I heard you, to say, I pass no verdicts to say, I think you can heal, or maybe, simply, I hope you do. What do I owe my subjects? And here's the flip side of that question. What exactly constitutes betrayal? Sometimes duty becomes more visible in its disappointment. I see in my own guilt what I hadn't fully realized I owed. I don't owe my subjects everything. I don't owe them the story they would have told about themselves. I don't owe them perfection on the page. 
but I owe them clarity around the terms of our relationship and the terms of my telling. I owe them, most importantly, the dignity of complexity on the page. I owe them the chance to contradict themselves, the chance to be more than evidence supporting a thesis statement I've devised for them to serve. When I wrote about people who self-identified as having a disease no one else believed in, I didn't owe it to them to agree with how they diagnosed themselves, but I did owe it to them not to turn their condition into a simple metaphor for a certain species of bodily unease or an abiding discomfort in one's own skin. I began to feel that turning them into metaphor was the worst kind of exploitation using them to support some argument I was making about how we attach our discomfort to external correlatives. This felt like forcing their pain to serve my own authorial agendas. What does the dignity of complexity look like? It often takes the form of context. When I wrote in another piece about a man who spoke obsessively about his wealth and his professional success, I didn't owe it to him to silence those obsessions, to make him look better or different than he was, somehow not obsessed with his own status. But it did feel important to contextualize his obsession with money inside an account of his childhood. His mother cleaning the homes of steel baron millionaires in an industrial town, his own teenage days working in a steel factory. Money meant something to him for a reason, I wanted to offer glimpses of that reason, the root systems of his attachment to the material. In this way, in granting my subjects the dignity of complexity, ethics and aesthetics align. Complication honors the many parts of a subject and constructs a figure on the page more alive, more faithful to lived experience in all its vexed nuance and mess. For a year, several years ago, I worked on a piece about a whale called 52 Blue, the whale I mentioned earlier, a blue whale named for its singular song, a song sung at a higher pitch than any other blue whale ever heard. This whale had never been seen, but he had been tracked by underwater Navy hydrophones, and he had always been tracked traveling alone, never with a mate, or a pod. For this reason, he'd been dubbed the loneliest whale in the world. A whale crying out with a song not like any others, a whale unable to find his tribe. In short, he'd become the canvas upon which a bunch of anthropomorphic projections had been flung. My piece was partially about the whale, but it was mainly about the many and various people who'd become obsessed with this whale, who had attached to him as a kind of mascot or comrade. My writing has always been interested in loneliness and the surprising escape hatches we find out of loneliness, and this whale was one of the most surprising escape hatches I'd ever heard of. I love the unexpected communion made possible by this singular creature and his singular song. I talked to people all over the world who had become attached to him or their various ideas of him. A tabloid photographer in Poland who got the whale tattooed across his back. A union leader in Ireland. A Muslim American woman in Michigan. But the woman I got to know best was a woman living in Harlem. She had an intense, very mystical way of talking about her connection to 52 Blue. Her comments moved me deeply, but I felt nervous about reproducing them. Would I make her sound crazy or foolish? I didn't want to, but I also didn't want to condescend to her by feeling I needed to modify or paraphrase her beliefs. Eventually, it felt like context was the answer, giving a full account of the period of crisis and bodily suffering that had given rise to her attachment to the whale. I began not with her obsession, but with the things that had delivered her to this obsession. July 2007, Harlem, New York. Leonora knew she was going to die. Not just someday, but soon. 
She'd been suffering from fibroids and bleeding for years, sometimes so heavily that she was afraid to leave her apartment, heavily enough that she grew obsessed with blood, thinking about blood, dreaming about blood, writing poems about blood. She'd grown increasingly reclusive. She'd stopped working as a case supervisor for the city, a job she'd held for more than a decade. Leonora was 48 years old. She had always been a self-sufficient person. She'd wor been working since she was 14. She'd never been married, though she'd had offers. She liked to know that she could support herself, but this was a new level of isolation. One family member had told her, you are in a very dark place, and said she no longer wanted to see her. By summer, things had gotten worse. Leonora felt truly ill, relentless nausea, severe constipation, aches across her whole body. Her wrists were swollen, her stomach bloated, her vision blurred with jagged spirals of color. She could hardly breathe when she was lying down, so she barely slept. When she did sleep, her dreams were strange. One night, she dreamed about a horse-drawn hearse moving across the cobblestone streets of another century's Harlem. She picked up the horse's reins, looked it straight in the eye, and knew it had come for her. She unlocked her apartment door so that her neighbors wouldn't have trouble removing her body before it, quote, stank up the place. She called her doctor to tell her as much, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. And her doctor got pissed, said she needed to call the paramedics, said she was going to live. So Leonora called the paramedics. When they were wheeling her off on a gurney, she asked them to turn around and take her back so she could lock the door again. This was how she knew she'd regained faith in her own life. If she wasn't going to die, she didn't want to leave her door unlocked. That request, asking the paramedics to turn around, is the last thing Leonora can remember before two months of darkness. That night in July was the beginning of a medical odyssey, five days of surgery, seven weeks in a coma, six months in the hospital, that would eventually deliver her, in her own time and her own way, to the story of 52 Blue. Leonora woke up in St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in September 2007. What had happened in the previous two months after the paramedics wheeled her out of her apartment, was only explained to her long after it was over, once she'd recovered enough to process it. The doctors had discovered that a severe intestinal blockage was making her ill, and she'd had major surgery over the course of five days. The surgeons removed everything the blockage had rotted. The more they looked, the more necrotic tissue and gangrene they found. They kept cutting out portions of her intestines, seven inches, nine inches, three inches, until they'd gotten it all. By the time they were finished, nearly three feet of her guts were gone. The remaining incision was huge. Leonora was put into a seven-week coma so she could recover more efficiently, and after she awoke, she remained hospitalized for several months to keep the open wound from becoming infected. She was on an IV. She hardly knew how to speak. She thought it was 1997. Her father came to visit once, and she vomited when she saw him. She could barely make herself understood, could barely convey how much she wanted him to leave. At one point, she sensed an incredible stench all around her. She didn't know where it was coming from. She said, smell, and someone understood. Eventually, they realized it was her hair, which was matted with blood. She asked one of her doctors to cut it. The doctor said that wasn't her job. Leonora said, if you don't do that, I will start screaming now, and I will not stop. The doctor did it. It turned out looking pretty good. Weeks later, they joked that the doctor might have a second career as a hairdresser. For Leonora, the hardest part of recovery was losing her self-sufficiency. Feeling that I could no longer be independent, she said, that I could no longer take care of myself. Ever since I was 14, I've been doing that. In the aftermath of her coma, Leonora couldn't walk. She had trouble remembering words. She couldn't count past 10. She couldn't even quite count to 10. But she pretended. She didn't let on. She didn't want other people to see her struggling. The hospital offered decent physical rehab, but nothing to help her re-inhabit her own mind. 
Leonora was wheeled into the hospital on July 6, 2007 and wasn't home again until 2008. She went to a rehabilitation facility in November, then had a bad fall, she still wasn't walking well, and returned to the hospital, then to another rehab in December. During those months at various institutions, she had visitors, but generally she felt abandoned, like everyone in her life was fleeing her damage, pushing her away for a simple, primal reason. The healthy don't like to be around the sick. Her illness made them uncomfortable because it reminded them of their own mortality or the fact of mortality itself. During much of her recovery, Leonora couldn't even watch television. It gave her headaches. So she turned to the internet. It was a way to find interest and beauty in the world. And it was then, alone and late at night, once again, searching for something that might offer a sense of meaning, that she came upon the story of 52 Blue. By then, the story of the whale had been floating around the internet for several years. But it spoke to Leonora with a particular urgency. It resonated. She said, he was speaking a language that no one else could speak. And here I was without a language. I had no more language to describe what had happened to me. So I too, I was like him. I had nothing, no one to communicate with. No one was hearing, no one was hearing him. And I thought, I hear you, I wish you could hear me. She identified with his plight. She felt that her own language was adrift. She was struggling to come back to any sense of self, much less find the words for what this self was thinking or feeling. It was hard to speak because her trachea was so scarred from all the tubes that had been thrust down it during her coma. She felt the world pulling away. When she found the whale, she found an echo of this difficulty. She remembers thinking, I wish I could speak whale. She found a strange kind of hope, a sense of certainty that he must know he wasn't alone. She said, I was like, here he is. He's talking, he's saying something, he's singing, and nobody's really understanding, but there are people listening. I bet he knows people are listening. He must feel it. Eventually, I didn't just write about Leonora, but also about my relationship with Leonora, about the relationship that had formed between us. I wrote about the red robin we saw one day, near the end of winter, and how she told me that robin was my robin, that it would signal a huge change in my life, and how three days later I met the man who would become my husband. My editor cut that detail, but I'm mentioning it here because it mattered to me. It mattered to implicate myself in the way Leonora understood herself as connected to the world, its, so its signals and omens, and it mattered to me to offer some account of the ways that Leonora and I had become connected to each other. I wrote about my interactions with Leonora not because I felt like I needed to be part of the story or to block her body figuratively with my own, but because I wanted to offer my experience of being moved by her relationship to the whale. I felt that I would allow more nuance into my portrait of Leonora by exploring the ways I was reckoning with her voice and with this strange attachment she had cultivated. I wasn't sure what to make of her, and there was something that felt productive in this uncertainty, that felt more productive than examining her as a specimen or fitting her life into the clear, certain brushstrokes of thesis statements I wanted to use her to support. In The Silent Woman, Janet Malcolm's brilliant account of the fraught legacy of Sylvia Plath, the ways that poet has become a canvas in her own right, the object of so much projection, an elusive whale upon which various narratives have been flung. Malcolm offers a description of the kind of authority that readers seek from their authors. Quote, every now and then, a biography comes along that strangely displeases the public. Something causes the reader to back away from the writer and refuse to accompany him down the corridor. What the reader has usually heard in the text, what has alerted him to danger, is the sound of doubt, the sound of a crack opening in the wall of the biographer's self-assurance. 
as a burglar should not pause to discuss with his accomplice the rights and wrongs of burglary while he is jimmying a lock, so a biographer ought not to introduce doubts about the legitimacy of the biographical enterprise. But I'm interested, and I think Malcolm is as well, by the ways that discussing the burglary while it's still going on can actually humanize a piece, can illuminate the human reporter at its center, a living, breathing person relating the living, breathing people she's interviewing. The first piece I ever reported, though I hesitate to even use that word reported because I really had no idea what I was doing, was in the mountains of Tennessee. I decided to follow my older brother to this crazy race he was running through a place called Frozen Head State Park. It was called the Barkley Marathons. Marathons, plural, because the race was 125 miles long. I wrote that piece with a mixture of bewilderment and appreciation, and it was important to me to allow for that electric charge of contradiction, the ways I was impressed and confused at once by what it meant for these people to willingly subject themselves to that kind of extremity and pain. A few years after I went to the Barkley Marathons, I found myself driving to a prison in the middle of West Virginia. I was going to visit Charlie Engel, one of the runners I'd met at Barkley, who was serving two years on counts of mortgage fraud. I'd been corresponding with him for a year because I wanted to write about his experience of incarceration. I explained our relationship in the piece. I first wrote Charlie a letter because I was fascinated by his life. It gave me a sense of vertigo to know that when we'd met in the hills of Tennessee, he'd had no idea what was about to happen, how everything was going to change. I wondered what incarceration was like for him. Running made him feel free and smooth and happy, he'd told me. His body was a body that found solace in moving itself across territory, across deserts and entire nations. The core of his life pointed its finger at the very fact of what incarceration does, which is to keep someone in one place. I wanted to know what happens when you can find a man whose whole life is motion. One thing that happens is you turn him into a good pen pal. Over the course of our correspondence, Charlie was smart and funny and honest. He steered himself away from anger about his incarceration, but he did so with such intentionality, such earnest and visible effort, that the anger itself emerged as a negative shape carved in the margins. Charlie described it as a cliff. He had to pull himself back from the brink. My anger is immense, and I hate the feeling that I am losing control, which happens mostly when I let that anger breathe. He looked for what he could salvage. Like all difficult things, if we can remain open, something positive will come. That said, I am still a bit baffled about what good will come from this for me. I lost a lot. He wrote about his mother, who was slipping into dementia. I miss her. I can say that it's unfair for me to be away from her, and it would be true. He wrote about women. I have never gone this long in my adult life without sex. I don't think I could have ever gone a year alone out there. Out there, incidentally, was a phrase I heard frequently at the Barkley Marathons, the ultra run where I had first met Charlie. At Barkley, out there meant in the wilderness, on the course, getting lost or getting found or whacking your way through underbrush. Out there meant you were in motion, doing the thing, winning or getting beaten. In here, in prison, was the opposite of all that. It meant never getting lost, never going where you hadn't already been. The morning I went to visit Charlie in prison, I woke up nervous. I wrote, I don't feel like I've gotten much sleep, but I can remember what I dreamed. I was interviewing a man in a dingy diner, and I had just gotten through my chit-chat questions and was preparing to get into it, though I wasn't sure what it was when the man rose to pay the bill. I woke with a feeling of panic. I hadn't asked any of the questions that mattered. It's a dream so obvious I feel betrayed by it. 
It neither dissolves an extant fear nor illuminates a new one. It simply tells me I'm afraid I'll say stupid things, as I'm always afraid of saying stupid things, that I will ask questions that are beside the point, that my curiosity will prove little more than useless voyeurism, a girl lifting her sunglasses to peer between the prison bars, stuttering, what's it like here? What part hurts the most? In prison, Charlie and I talked for six hours straight. We got vending machine pastries and sodas with rolls of quarters that I had brought. After our visit, I felt close to Char Charlie, but I also felt the fallacy embedded in that feeling of closeness. I'd left prison. He remained. I felt concern for him and sadness for him and sadness at the fact of incarceration itself, its vast, inhuman, unjust scale, this tiny sliver of it that I'd seen. And I felt glad for the hours I'd spent with Charlie, but also acutely aware of how limited they'd been, how built into the whole journalistic project was a set of limits about how much you could ever know about another person. I was aware of leaving him behind in there as its own form of betrayal. I decided to write about that betrayal rather than simply leaving it unarticulated in the margins. At 3 p.m., some of us exercise our right to disappear and others are reminded that they no longer can. One man exercises his right to run 540 times around a gravel track. That was something Charlie had done to stay in shape. What happens when you confine a man whose whole life is motion? I guess that those laps. Maybe tonight I'll meet that stranger again. Maybe he'll come back to the greasy diner in my dream. Maybe I'll buy him a Coke or a cookie the size of his face, and he can stand for every man who's ever had a story, and I can stand for everyone who hasn't listened hard enough. I'll ask that stranger every single question any person ever asked another person. I'll ask enough questions to dissolve rhetoric and cinder block partitions. I'll ask him enough questions to make him visible again. So many questions will have to stay in the dream of that diner forever. Looking back, I realize that the difficulties embedded in my relationship with Charlie are not difficulties I left behind when I left prison or when I finished the final round of edits on that piece. With Charlie, I'd become aware of a certain fantasy of proximity, the longing for closeness, for writing as connective transparency, and that I would probably carry this fantasy into every journalistic encounter I ever had. It didn't make me a saint, and it didn't make me an idiot. It didn't even necessarily make me unprofessional. It was simply something I'd have to reckon with. I'd have to reckon with an inevitable and ultimately productive distance, just as I'd have to reckon each time with the necessary limits of my own understanding, with everything that would remain mysterious. Thank you. We'll now be opening it up for the Q&A. As always, preference goes to students. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I've also read um, some of your pieces, the empathy exams and also the Morgellons disease um, in um, a few of my classes. And based on those and your wonderful talk, I'm wondering, so both of those pieces certainly have a structure and um, have a flow and organization that makes sense and definitely doesn't come off as formulaic. And I'm wondering, how are you able to kind of like break kind of certain, I don't know, the, kind of the easy way to structure things or the obvious way or allow yourself to like have more creative um, breaks in the norm of writing and, and how have you learned to do that? Yeah, it's a great question. I love, I'm like a total structure and craft nerd, so I love questions that speak to that um, part of the writing process. Um, I would say part of the process of discovery with every piece that I write isn't just what it is that the piece is going to say, because almost never do I know the argument or even the illuminations of a piece when I start out, or maybe I think I do, but if the piece is going well, it means it's like thwarting all those expectations and disrupting all those arguments and plans. 
but the content is only one unknown. The structure is always an unknown, and part of what's pleasurable to me as a writer is seeing the ways that particular kinds of content can suggest structures that I've never used before. So, for example, with the piece about Morgellons disease that I referenced here, um, I ended up using as a springboard for the structure um, the official report that the CDC had written about uh, Morgellons disease, which had, I'm not going to be able to remember all of them in this moment, but it was divided into sections almost like a lab report, like um, experiment, results, conclusions, um, and I wanted to use those same headings that the CDC had used in their report, but to kind of undermine the whole premise of them, because what the CDC was trying to do was make a determination about whether this disease was real in a clinical sense or not, which, which was their project and, and not my project. My project was not to um, try to just land on the idea that the only important information was, is this physiologically real or not, but that there was so much more truth out there than just the answer to that question. So I wanted to use the kind of formulaic elements of a clinical report, but to undermine them by filling those same headings with my own writing, which essentially kind of posed or left unanswered more questions than it tried to resolve. So in that case, I was adopting a structure in order to kind of push back against it um, with the title essay of my collection, which for those of you who haven't read it, is about working as a medical actor, um, which was a job where I received these kind of dossiers that described the patients that I was supposed to be. Um, I decided at a certain point in the drafting process that I wanted to bring my own personal experiences as a medical patient into the piece. and. I was having a lot of hesitation. I was talking about this in the afternoon session. I had a lot of hesitation about bringing my own personal narrative in, largely because I didn't want to make it seem like I felt sorry for myself or I was trying to play some kind of victim role. Um, and so I ended up kind of having to trick myself into including personal narrative by turning my story into one of these medical acting dossiers. And in that way, a kind of formal experiment injected a sort of excitement and a kind of newness of perspective into my own life, which almost by definition is kind of familiar material or material that we all have these kind of ready-made familiar narratives about, but the structural experiment sort of allowed me to, to make that material strange again and see it in, in, in a new way. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm Shreya and I'm a sophomore at CNC. Um, I especially liked your description about the dream of not asking the right questions. So this is my question to you. If there is one question that in your experience tells you the most about a person, what would that question be? <sighs> That's a great, this is now sounds horrifically self-referential. That's a great question. Um, <sighs> often, I don't know whether it has exactly the same wording every time, but I often find that questions about when or how people have been surprised open up interesting avenues. So um, sometimes when I'm interviewing other authors, I will ask when or how a project has surprised them. Um, I definitely know that when I visited Charlie in prison, I asked him what, had, what were the things that had surprised him about prison. Um, and I think that that idea of surprise often, it doesn't just get you to material that might be interesting because it, if it was surprising to somebody else, there's a good chance that it would be surprising to more people. But the idea is like getting at a moment when somebody was surprised often takes you into a moment where they were a little bit vulnerable or somehow unsettled or their own ideas about something had been challenged or overturned. And often those are also moments of revelation or transition. Um, but but somehow if you ask somebody like, when was the moment where you were transformed? Or like, when was the moment where you experienced revelation? Like, there's a kind of grandness to those things that can be alienating. But that idea of just like, when were you surprised is, um, there's a little bit more easy access there, I think. Thank you for, for talking to us tonight. Um, at the end of the empathy exams, you have a line, I think, where you say, um, I want to write about the lesson I learned here. And that made me curious 
uh, about how you think about experiences as you're experiencing them, uh, knowing that you may write about them later. Yeah, it's like the writer's predicament. We're like always <laughs> taking photographs of life as it's happening. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one thing to say is how I'm thinking about an experience as I'm having it is rarely the same way as I'll think about it six months later or a year later or two years later or five years later. Um, but I'm not a writer who, or I, as, a, as, as a person, as a writer, I don't necessarily think that it's like a telos thing where the further away from an experience you are, like the more wisdom you have about it or the more truthful your experience of it. I think that is an opinion some people hold, like the more time you give yourself, the closer to the truth of the experience you'll get. For me, it's more like soil samples or something. How you feel about something as it's happening is one truth. How you feel about it six months later is another truth. How you feel about it 10 years later is another truth. Um, and it's more interesting to me to like line those truths up and track whatever evolution happens than to decide that one of them is like the truest version of a thing. Um, but in terms of how, so I, I often sort of take whatever recollection I had of what something felt like as I was living it as like one truth among many. Um, that said, I, you know, it's not like I'm constantly writing down everything that happens in my life as it's happening so that I can cannibalize it as material for some further piece. Um, but I, you know, I do have a, an inconsistent but somewhat committed journaling practice, and I certainly, certainly use journals um, when I'm writing about my own life. I also use emails. I have a lot of important friendships and relationships in my life where I'm describing things, and, and so my old Gmail archives are usually resources if I'm trying to summon something from the past. Um, and I would say my journaling practice has evolved somewhat over time. I used to basically just write about my feelings but then I realized it's really, there's like little that's more boring 10 years later than just reading about your feelings. And so I started to write about other stuff like what I ate for breakfast or like the car I saw across the road. Um, and those things actually are incredibly interesting, at least to me, years later. It's like, what were the actual people, places, and things that populated your life? And those often take you back into that time or that experience um, more usefully than just the like abstract dissection of your whatever self-involved interior life. So um, so I've, I've tried to kind of when I do record things, it's, it's also become a bit more exterior in terms of what it is that I'm what it is that I'm transcribing. Hi, thank you so much for coming to talk with us. My question um, revolves a little bit about how you decide who you will be writing about and what draws you personally to those types of narratives? Yeah. Um, often my process of deciding what I want to write about is a mixture of intuition, like following a hunch or what, what I'm interested in, um, pragmatics, like who I encounter and how I encounter them. Like it's a little bit part of the talk, but. Um, for example, I wrote this piece about the ultra marathon in Tennessee, and that was how I had come to meet and know about the story of, of Charlie Engel and his incarceration. And so there was a there was an element of happenstance to that, like doing one story had put me into contact with the beginnings of the next story. But there was also an element of there always has to be something that I'm compelled by. And in that case, it was this question of maybe focusing on this man who found so much meaning in motion could give me a particular way to think about what the experience of incarceration was like. So it was a combination of him being um, in my path or somebody that I discovered and then my, my feeling connected to and curious about something in his experience. Um, and you know, when I take an aerial view, I can tell you like some of the things that I tend to be drawn to, like I do, tend to be drawn to people who um, feel that they've been misunderstood or especially communities that form around certain kinds of shared experiences of misunderstanding. I'm certainly interested, as I said here, in varieties and experiences of loneliness and, and remedies for loneliness or how people try to remedy their loneliness. Um, but those kinds of abstract considerations 
aren't necessarily always coming into play when I'm following a piece. It's more like a dog tracking a scent or something like that, where I'm like, oh, this, this seems compelling to me. Um, and I, I sometimes also will get ideas, editors will come to me with ideas. Um, and with those, often, it, often they are interesting to me, because if it's a good editor, they're, they've you know read my work and know what kinds of stuff I'm drawn to. And so they'll bring me something where I, even if I know I should say no, or I have too many projects, like. I'll often just say yes anyway because it feels like impossible to refuse. Um, but it's the same thing. It always there always has to be something that speaks to me in the piece where I don't necessarily know what I'm going to say, but I know what I'm curious about. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming. I want to ask about you mentioned sort of trying to work around prevent yourself from being like a voyeur in some sense as you dealt with other people's experiences. I want to ask how, particularly when you first like meet someone or, or, or like approach them to say, I want to ask about your story, like how do you then try and phrase it to them to explain what you're doing to like overcome that fear, right? Like how do you frame that approach so that they don't like you don't like, scare them off or anything? Right. So yeah, how do I? How am I transparent with somebody from the outset to try to avoid that danger of just being a voyeur, um, but without kind of totally alienating them or? Is that, is that, am I getting it right? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's so important to me. I definitely feel the temptation sometimes to underplay the, you know, I want to write about this, I'm interviewing you as a journalist element of things because, you know, I want the version of somebody that's most open and most forthcoming and is giving me the, you know, their best stories and their most private feelings. Um, but I try to be pretty strict with myself about being as clear as I can from the outset. And also when you're interviewing, you know, if you're recording the interview, there's a constant palpable physical reminder there that it's not just a conversation, that there's something else going on. And in a way, I appreciate that. I appreciate that I'm not like a, you know, super technical pro. So for me, it's just like my iPhone usually. but. Um, I appreciate that there's this concrete thing between us that is reminding both of us um, about the, the terms of our engagement because it feels more ethically responsible to me than if, if I was trying to kind of like slip that under the rug or dissolve it. Um, and, you know, I think, I find the process of interviewing is about battling, at least for me, coming up against a lot of different fears or anxieties, the anxiety that um, it's going to put somebody off that I want to write about their story or I'm curious about their story, the anxiety that I'll ask as your question got to, like the wrong questions or um, the qu questions that might kind of invite somebody to, to shut down or, um, you know, that they'll feel by the very nature of my questions that I don't get them or don't understand them. Like the act of interviewing is um, full of tr tremendous anxiety, not to mention the kind of preemptive anxiety of how will this person feel about the things I write or say about them. Um, but I, I think in a way that's like as it should be, like the, the process of interviewing or the process of turning somebody's life into a narrative is such a fraught process that for it to feel easy or for it to feel devoid of anxiety would somehow mean that some, some of what was going on there had been forgotten. It's like when we drive cars around, we're driving like massive, deadly creatures of steel, you know? And it's like worth remembering that, maybe not obsessively all the time, but every once in a while, I think in the same way that it's worth, you know, discussing the terms of the burglary or at least being honest with yourself about the terms of the burglary as it's going on. I don't think that writing about people is the same thing as burglary, but I do think it's, um, yeah, it's prudent to, to stay alive to, to everything that should feel anxious about it. Hi, first thing I want to thank you for giving that wonderful talk. Um, my question revolved more about the relationship aspect of your talk. And as you mentioned before, ta uh, some of the things that you write about are, are incredibly vulnerable to people. They're really sensitive topics. How do you break through that barrier between you as an interviewer and someone who's experienced that? And once you do that, because this is what something I've experienced. How do you disentangle yourself from that experience? Because when you're writing, you're so, you're just into it. Your heart and soul is into it. And you some, 
somehow live their experience, how do you then walk away from it as the same person or do you, are you the same person after that experience? Yeah, it's a beautiful question. I think, um, I guess to start with the end of the question, I don't think, I, I don't think I'm the same person after the process of writing any given piece as I was before and probably on a micro level, like after each conversation, I'm a little bit different. I, at the very least, I have a new data point in my sense or my understanding of the world and what it holds. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't strive to remain unchanged by those conversations or the process of writing pieces or the relationships that I form with subjects. Um, I'm, I'm open to and cognizant of and often quite excited by the ways that those can be transformative experiences. Um, you know, I mentioned the red robin that Leonora and I saw, and uh, at one point Leonora drew me a uh, drawing of the robin that is like on my refrigerator at home. You know, I feel um, certain relationships do become part of part of me and part of my life. So I don't think that the goal has to be or even should be kind of objective distance. Um, you know. There are reporters who cultivate a very different kind of practice and a different relationship with their subjects, and and I, I absolutely think there might be a place for that kind of work, um, but it's it's not the work that I'm interested in. My my work is more about less about trying to deny that there has been some sort of emotionally charged interaction or that I brought emotional baggage to the encounter or that that emotional baggage um, changed or inflected how I saw that person or what our conversation was like. It's less about trying to deny that bias, that subjectivity, that baggage, and more about trying to examine it and bring it into the light and say, how, how, how did my own past or my own perspective or my own assumptions, how did, how did those inform this conversation? And on the flip side, how did the way that, how did the emotional charge between me and the subject sort of shape or inflect the way that I heard what they were saying? You know, it's like not about trying to push those things into the margin, but trying to explore them and say what kind of meaning lies in that subjectivity rather than try to make it objective. I have a question yeah. um, that kind of uh, just came to me, but um, since no one else raised their hand, uh, a lot of your stories kind of revolve around the issue of health, and um, it seems like you in a lot of ways share the role of a doctor in that you're in people's lives kind of at their lowest point. And I was wondering if you had any stories or if they had ever shared if you actually helped them deal with some of those things that they had been through. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I've certainly heard from subjects that there was something helpful about our interaction. I would say both Leonora and Charlie, the people that I mentioned in this piece, expressed some version of that to me, you know. Um, I think for Charlie, part of what it meant to be incarcerated, and I think he's not alone in this experience, is that he felt uh, invisible. He felt like even a lot of the people who were closest to him in his life didn't want to think too much about what his experience in prison was like. Um, you know, it connects to the C.D. Wright quote uh, that came out of her visits to Louisiana prisons where she said, you know, uh, part of what it means to be in prison is to be apart from. And so I think Charlie felt that in having somebody engage with him and ask him so many questions about what it was like to, to be him in the letters and in our phone calls and in our visit, and then in the piece I ended up writing that there was something about just trying to see him that felt meaningful. I don't know. It certainly didn't um, heal or begin to heal the damage that incarceration had done to him, but, um, but I think it was helpful to him in some way. Um, and I think for Leonora, there was a feeling of invisibility and isolation that it pushed back against in a, in a, in a small way to, um, to have somebody engaging with her story and trying to understand it. I went, one of the last times I saw Lenor, I went to a, an art show at, the, at her community recreation center where she had painted a, a, a painting of the whale. Um, and you know, I think it meant something to her to have somebody show up and to see this piece of art that she had made. And you know, I was also there 
as a writer who was writing about her, and so I was there for my own reasons as well. I was gathering material, she knew that, but I don't think that the fact of that relationship sort of precluded other things that were true, which is that I also cared about her and wanted her to know that somebody had showed up to see this art she had made. So um, I guess healing might be too absolute a word for what I ever offer subjects, but maybe there's um, a kind of a kind of balm or some kind of help there sometimes. Thank you for coming in. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. So a lot of what you spoke about and of course what you've written about in the empathy exams and your other writing uh, is kind of a connection to um, an understanding of your, your subjects. And I'm wondering if there is a fictional character from a book you've read that you feel most connected to um, or a lot of empathy for? Hmm. Um, well, the, the person who is coming to mind, although there are probably many that I could choose, and it might be that I am haunted by the ghost of David Foster Wallace or haunted by hearing him discussed by um, Will earlier today, but... Um, I got your name right, yeah? yeah okay, <laughs> I had a moment of terror. Um, but uh, one of the characters who I have felt the most tenderness towards is um, Don Gately, who's the protagonist of um, Wallace's novel, Infinite Jest. And Gately is a felon and recovering addict, for those who haven't read the novel. Um, and you know, he's like a big meathead in a certain way. Um, he's the manager at a um, uh, rehab. And, you know, his acts of heroism are very small, like listening to somebody without telling them to shut up or keeping little bottles of urine in his refrigerator, even though it pisses them off to have them near his, like, seltzer bottles that are all he can drink because he doesn't drink anymore. And, you know, it's very small-scale stuff, like, um, just kind of showing up and trying to be present for people. Um, and I love that he's this like big, beefy guy with big, massive hands, and he uses those hands to carry people cakes for their sobriety birthdays. And the last 200 pages of the novel are sort of about his struggle, whether or not to take morphine after he's been shot. And that there's something, you know, that struggle takes place quietly and painfully in a single hospital room. Um, but it's like one of the most moving and dramatic sequences I've ever read. So um, he's somebody both for the kind of surprise of him and some of the contradictions in him and um, the, the very sort of humble scale his heroism sometimes takes um, are all things I, I love in him, so. Thank you so much, everyone. Please join me once more in thanking Leslie Jameson. <laughs>